Good morning. Here are yet again for another lovely session of CENG 3325 Structural Analysis. This is going to be the seventh lecture in the video series, and today we're going to look and continue with a uh, discussion of the method of joints uh, to solve uh, truss problems. Now, in particular, I want to look at uh, using the method of joints in combination with a basic matrix uh, method in order to uh, solve for the unknown forces in a truss. Okay, so this is going to be methods of joints, of the method of joints via matrix analysis. Uh, method of joints. Let us look at matrix methods. And uh, for my students, I do want to make sure to instill upon you this, this semester some appreciation of how computer programs uh, that actually calculate uh, forces inside structural members work. And I think a good introduction to that would be a uh, truss method. So let us consider a, uh, the kind of thing we did in the previous video, where we had a single joint. And you might have some force 1 on here and force 2 on here. But then you would have some sort of, uh, then you have a few forces. Maybe you'd have F1, F2, just some arbitrary number of forces. Uh, here, maybe an F3. And just for fun, maybe I'll put a uh, other force on here, maybe an F4. Or actually, for consistency or for completion's sake, maybe I'll put a, I don't know, a 5 kip applied load to this joint. And, you know, for extra fun, maybe I'll just put a reaction on here. Or if this was joint A, maybe this would be something like an AY. And so this would have, uh, so I'm, I'm, this would definitely have some force triangles on here, but uh, I'm just going to illustrate the process uh, briefly here. So I'll just mention this having an X component and a Y component. Now, we remember previously that we would break down, uh, or we would look at the equilibrium of this joint in both the X and the Y direction. So we would do a sum of forces X is equal to, maybe you'd have something like negative F1 uh, in the x direction, so we'd have to multiply by a force triangle to get the, by, or the ratios from a force triangle to get the x component, uh, plus f2, its x component, plus f3, and then this would equal 0. That would equal 0, fairly straightforward. Then sum of forces y would equal something like, oh, f1, y, plus maybe an F2y, minus 5 kips, and then plus Ay is equal to 0. So what we have here, or what we observe here, is that we have a series of two things. We have two things here. We have two equations of equilibrium. And so we're going to have uh, each joint, again, gives us two equations of equilibrium. Uh, of equilibrium and uh, each member force and reaction represents an unknown. Represents an unknown variable that we need to solve for. that we will need to solve for. So, and this is what comes from R, M plus R equals 2J. We have unknowns and equations defined unknowns. So our M plus R represents our uh, unknown forces or our unknown variables, and our 2J represents the equations to find these unknowns. So I'm going to bring this back to basic algebra. Remember basic algebra? Matrix algebra? Well, maybe you wouldn't call that basic algebra, but you can remember basic algebra. 
uh, you may recall even from basic algebra the idea of simultaneous equations. You may, you may remember simultaneous equations. So, uh, in other words, if you now you the basic the most basic example of simultaneous equations would be your oh way back remember way back in algebra or pre-algebra you had something like oh here is the equation of one line and here is the equation of another line and solve for the intersection of the two lines in a plane. That's the most basic example you'll have of solving uh, simultaneous equations. But we know from uh, matrix methods that there are, and from high, uh, and for other, from other high-level math classes, that there are a uh, any number of ways to solve uh, s systems of equations, and the length of the linear equations can be quite long. We can have uh, linear equations with many different variables, etc. But how is how does this uh, apply itself uh, to uh, something like truss, uh, solving a truss? So how would this work to solving a truss? Well, we know that we can solve a, uh, we know that uh, solving equations is very, uh, matri matrices can be very useful to solve systems of equations. So matrices are very useful for solving large systems of equations. And if you have something like a truss where uh, all of the all of the number of forces are unknown, all of the reactions are unknown, um, and each joint provides two equations of equilibrium, whether you realize it or not, what you have there fundamentally is a uh, is a matrix system. Let's illustrate this here. So, let's see. Basically, we're going to set up a table where uh, the matrix table, at least for trusses. For trusses, we'll use something like this. The rows will represent uh, rows represent equations of equilibrium. Of equilibrium, and the columns are going to be unknowns, uh, unknown forces, and re un I should say unknown member forces, and reactions. However, I'm going to add something, uh, I'm going to put in a little modifier here, and we need to do this in order to actually have something that we can solve using, um, now, uh, using uh, matrix inversion, which is the most convenient way of solving matrices. So, we could set up equations of equilibrium and then use your standard row operations like, oh, multiply one row by two and add to the row below, multiply one row by negative three and add to the row below, uh, what have you, add row one, row three together, that kind of thing. But that gets tedious very quickly. What I would like to do instead is I would like to configure a, um, a matrix so that I can just take the inverse of it and directly solve for the internal forces in one operation, and ideally using a computer method. And so what I want to do today is I want to show you how to do this using a common computer software application, and that of course is Excel. Okay, so if you have, so we're going to have to modify our equations of equilibrium here. So like I mentioned here, you have like a, F, if, you, if you had, for example, a sum of forces in the x direction, you would have maybe an F1x plus F2x plus F3x, then plus maybe a applied force 1. In the x direction, maybe it's an, an x component of that, and then plus some reaction in the x direction. These are the things that you can have in an equation of equilibrium. These will not necessarily always be in an equation of equilibrium, but these are the three things that can. Uh, in fact, maybe I'll even put this like as a P here instead of a F to make clear that I'm not talking about a member forces. I'm not talking about a member force. So the things I can have in an equation of equilibrium, for a truss anyway, this would be uh, member internal forces, I could have applied loads, and I could have reactions. And you know, I should probably just put a little x subscript on in here to indicate that this is a load in the x direction. Now, if you run through a, if you actually go and create a set of equations like this for a truss, 
you'll find that uh, you have a slight problem if you're trying to invert a matrix that's written exactly like this. And the reason for that is that your matrix will not be square. So we have to make one slight modification to this. And that is, instead of all of this equaling zero, which it really does, I'm going to move the applied load to the right, to the right side of the equation. So I'll have f1x plus f2x plus f3x is equal to any, uh, or plus any reactions in the x direction, uh, will equal the opposite of any applied forces, or negative p, negative px. So more broadly, I can look at, I can sort of sketch out a matrix here. Let's imagine a, let's put together a, br a brief matrix here. So I'll put together a matrix, something like this. Let's see, I wanna have, oh, a few columns. Maybe this would be member F1. Member F1 here. F1, F2, um, let's see, member F1, that would be member force one. Uh, member F2, member F3, etc. And then I might have, and then <clears throat> I might have reaction one, reaction two, and reaction three. And then uh, this would then equal the opposite of any uh, applied forces in the following in the column over here. And I will perform an example. And then my rows are gonna be my uh, equilibrium equations on my joints. So I might have uh, the sum of, sum of forces on joint one in the x direction. I might have the sum of forces on joint two in the x direction. Let, let's go ahead and say sum of forces on joint one in the y direction. Usually I set it up that way because it's a little bit easier to work with one joint at a time then, although you could do it either way, uh, sum of forces on joint two in the x direction, sum of forces on joint two in the y direction, like this here, maybe a sum of forces on joint three in the x direction, and a sum of forces on joint four, or a sum of forces on joint three in the y direction. on joint three in the y direction. And so what goes so and so what goes on into these equations or what goes into these boxes I should say or into these cells are going to be the coefficients that appear uh, in our equations of equilibrium. So for example if I had a three four five triangle of or uh, for example if I had a uh, F three here F3 is going to be purely in the x direction. So if I had an F3, if I was doing a equilibrium on joint 3, if that was joint 3, for example, I would put a positive 1 for that uh, coefficient because a, a positive 1 would appear as a coefficient in an equation of equilibrium. If F3 uh, had a, it was in the negative, was purely in the negative x direction, I would put a coefficient of negative 1. But more commonly, you're often going to have a fractional coefficients here. This is for uh, members that are at angles. And notice what we have here then. We have a few major, uh, we have a few major things. We have our coefficient matrix. This becomes our coefficient matrix. These represent the coefficients that we multiply by our member forces in order to get the member internal forces. So this would be uh, coefficients uh, coefficients or force coefficients and I could call this matrix A 
And then this would be our constants. This would be our constant matrix. Wouldn't be a square matrix. It would be a, a uh, again, a uh, matrix with a column with only a single column. And this would equal. Maybe we can call this matrix B. And then you have uh, then in our matrix equation, we would also have another matrix, and this would be matrix X. Perhaps we could call it our variable matrix. But this doesn't actually show up in our spreadsheet that we'll work on later. A variable matrix. And the basic idea of our equation is that we're going to have A uh, times X is equal to B. And then we can solve for, the, uh, for X by saying that X is equal to the inverse of matrix A times matrix B. And combining those two together, we will be able to find, we'll be able to, in one step, directly solve for all of the reactions and the internal forces, basically all of our unknowns. The great thing about this is everything here is comes from the truss geometry. Everything here is just known external loads applied to the structure. So we know all this, we know all this. When we, put, when we carefully craft our matrix and put these together, or carefully craft our matrices and put this together, we will be able to uh, solve for all of our unknowns, both unknown reactions and unknown member forces. All right, so I'd like to look at the example that we worked through last time. Previously, we worked through this using a series of free body diagrams and uh, solve for each individual force one at a time uh, using basic sum of forces in the x, sum of forces in the y, equations of equilibrium. So I'd like to redraw this here in case uh, people watching this one haven't seen the previous videos or the previous video where I use this example. But feel free to cross-reference it uh, and, and observe the two different methods of solving uh, for the same set of forces. So we have a truss like this. And looking at this, we have a pin here, a roller here, and we have a reaction force, or sorry, an applied force of 10 kips here. So 10 kips, and then we have dimensions of 24 feet, uh, 24 feet, and 9 feet. So that makes each of these slanted members at an angle of a 345 triangle. And that will make it easier to uh, solve for our unknown forces. So we have, uh, or to set up our equations of equilibrium, to set up our, oh, to set up our uh, uh, matrix, etc. 24 feet, and this is 9 feet here. And 9 feet here. Okay. So what I need to do is I'm going to have to set up very similar equations of uh, equilibrium uh, again, except this time I'm going to use a uh, I'm going to use a matrix to do this. Okay. So I, and I'm going to set up for my particular program that I'm going to use. I'm going to use Excel. Now there are of course many different options for uh, mathematical programs. You could do this in MATLAB quite easily, but I'm going to set this up using Excel. Okay, so I have a uh, matrix set up here, and I know that I'm going to have, uh, let's see, I know that I'm going to have seven unknown forces. So I'm going to set this up. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven members in this truss, so I'm going to set it up with um, seven uh, spaces for member forces. And uh, let's see, in terms of member forces, Oh, let's also get the joint labels I had last time. Let's get that up there. I'm gonna be, I wanna be consistent with what I had last time. So let me just go ahead and finish this drawing out so we have everything on the same page. Uh, this was, that's gonna be a three, four, five. Uh, three, four, five like this. Uh, three, four, five like this. Three, four, five like this. and a 3, 4, 5 like this. A 3, 4, 5 like this. And then my joint labels uh, are A, B, C, D, and E. So therefore my unknown forces 
uh, are gonna be a B my members my member list is a B uh, let's see a C a D and then so we have these three and then maybe uh, C D then B D and D E and D E and then B E so those are our seven unknown forces. Well, we already do know them from last time, but let's uh, solve them again, this time using a matrix. So our unknown forces, I'm gonna put those up at the top. I have A, B. I'm gonna go ahead and center everything. I have A, B. Uh, then let's see, A, C, A, D. Uh, and then of course, C, D, uh, D, E and then BD and BE. And those are our seven unknown forces. Now, we also have three other unknowns, and these are our reactions. And I'm gonna set them up as, uh, let's see, CX, CY, and EY. And then in the horizontal, I'm gonna have, uh, let's gonna, I'm gonna do, Oh, let's see, you know what? I'll be uh, a little fancy here. I'll actually put in my sigma. That's not really that fancy, but uh, let's get a sigma in here. Uh, let's see, where's my sigma? Capital sigma here. So I'll just end up copying and pasting that. So I'll have sum of forces on joint A in the X direction. I'll have the sum of forces on joint A in the Y direction. And then I'm going to copy these down uh, to give me um, 10 rows altogether. So we'll have some forces on joint B in the Y direction, joint uh, in the X direction, joint B in the Y direction, uh, and then that will be joint C in the X direction, and joint C in the Y direction, and then joint D in the X direction, and joint D in the Y, uh, and joint D in the Y direction, so previous X direction, uh, joint uh, E in the X direction, and joint E in the Y direction. And so then all of these will equal our uh, external reactions, or sorry, external applied forces. So we'll have uh, negative applied forces, opposite of the applied forces. Or maybe I can just call this the negative P. So whatever force is going to be, uh, whatever force appears on our drawing, uh, we'll, we're gonna go and call that negative P. Like that, there we go. And there we just, that's just a slight Excel notation to make clear that that's just a label. Okay, negative P is in the cell. So we have our matrix here, we have a 10 by 10 matrix. We have a 10 by 10 matrix, 10 columns, and 10 rows. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert the appropriate, uh, I'm going to insert the appropriate, uh, uh, let's say the appropriate equations from our free body diagram. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and pull up the previous exploded view, and I'm going to copy that into this one here so that we can reference it as we move along. So this is one where it can be very useful uh, to actually get the full exploded view. I'll go and put that right here. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is look at joint A here, and I'm gonna try to fit these both, uh, if I can, on the same screen. So we can go and reference these as we go. Oh, not the wrong folder there. Let's get this here, go away, Excel, okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is look at uh, joint A here. I wanna set up the equations of equilibrium for joint A in the X direction. So looking at, looking at this joint, I have AB, AD, and AC. AD, or AB here, is going in the positive X direction. So well, actually, first of all, I'm gonna go ahead and put by default a coefficient of, one, of zero on all of these things because most of these things in most cases will not have anything in them. So I'm just gonna apply a zero across the board and then just have non-zero items 
for wherever a particular member force appears uh, anywhere in a joint's equation of equilibrium. So I'll do that here, same thing here, zero all the way down. Now, again, back to joint A, I have FAB in the X direction, pulling in the X direction, so I'm going to put a 1 there. Then I have AC, and if you look, AC is going in the negative X direction, and the multiplier, the coefficient to get the FAC to its X component is going to be negative 4 over 5. So for AC, I'm going to put negative 4 over 5 here, equals negative 4 over 5 then AD is going to equal positive 4 over 5. And that it represents uh, equation A in the X direction. And we don't have any applied loads on joint A in the X direction, so we don't have to worry about that for this particular equation of equilibrium. Now, I now I want to look at joint A in the Y direction. So looking at this, I have uh, AC and AB. Those are the two unknown forces they're going to have, that are going to have any components on joint A in the Y direction. So uh, AC is going to be, uh, went down to one page down, uh, AC is going to have a negative 3 over 5. Negative 3 over 5, again that's the multiplier to get the, uh, to get the uh, Y component in the negative direction of FAC, of the member of, of the force in member AC. And we will in turn have the same thing here, AD, this will equal negative 3 over 5. And those are the only two unknown member forces that have, uh, that have a vertical component of force applied to joint A. So we don't need AB in the Y direction because it's purely in the horizontal direction. Are we done? No, we're not. Not on joint A anyway. Because what I need, I need to consider my externally applied load. See this negative 10 kip force, the main load that was applied to the truss? I need to include that in my uh, forces. Now, you might be tempted to put negative 10 kips because this thing is pointed downward. But remember, we're going to put the opposite of the member forces into our matrix, so I'm going to put a positive 10. This is, a, this is an external load applied to the truss at joint A in the Y direction, so that's why it appears there. And in fact, this is our only uh, applied member force anywhere on that truss, so this is the only row uh, in this uh, column that will have any force in it. But you can see that you can have as many forces as you want, and what you do here is, um, if you, if for example, uh, how do you handle multiple forces on the same joint in the same direction? Well, if you had, say, a 10 kip force downward and a 5 kip force upward applied at joint A, uh, you would go with the net force, which in that case would be a net uh, downward uh, 5 kip force. Next, I want to look at joint B. So let me go over here, and maybe I can, actually, let me, let me zoom in on these joints as I work through them. So let's look at joint B. Uh, joint B, in the X direction, I'm going to have negative FAB. FAB is going in the negative X direction, so I need to put a negative 1 on this. Again, do not confuse these numbers as tension or compression. The final values we get when we invert this matrix will be positive for tension and negative for compression. But here, you're going to apply multipliers indicating the actual directions, the uh, left, right, uh, up, down, that the uh, you're going to put signs like negative being to the left and down, upward or positive being upward and to the right uh, that would appear in the, your equations of equilibrium. So FAB is purely in the uh, x direction, but in the negative x direction, so it's going to get a multiplier of negative 1 for the sum of forces uh, on joint B in the x direction row. Then BD, BD here, is in the negative, has a component in the negative x direction, but not all of it's in the negative x direction. So I'm going to need negative uh, and then a multiplier, 4 over 5. Negative 4 over 5. Then I have BE, and it's going to be positive 4 over 5. It's the same slope. Oh, equals 4 over 5, not April. Oh, that has, okay. I need to adjust my cell properties, I see. It wants to be in dates, so. I need to adjust my cell properties, and I'm going to put that in numbers, not in uh, dates, because it's, it's Excel can be too smart for its own good sometimes. So uh, BE then was going to be uh, 4 over 5. 
and that will fix that problem. Again, this is the uh, that this is the multiplier to get the x component of the force in member BE applied uh, to joint B. Then in the y direction, I have no external loads, and just like in, and then also in the on joint B in the x direction, there are no external loads, so this column remains zero. And in fact, I'm just I'm going to stop mentioning that because uh, the only external load we had applied anywhere on the truss was uh, on joint A. Okay. Then I want to look at joint B in the y direction, and the only two member forces that have any component on joint B in the y direction will be BD and BE. BD here uh, will have a component of that looks like negative uh, 0 0.6 or negative 3 over 5. And same thing here for BE, again, equal to negative 3 over 5. Okay, next I want to move on to joint C. And looking at this, I want to consider uh, the, th the things on joint C. Now, in on uh, joint C in the x direction, I'm going to have FAC. And to get the x component of this, this is going to be, uh, I mean, I'm going to need to multiply uh, the force in member AC by 4 over 5, positive because that has a component in the positive x direction. Then um, CD, member CD, will have a multiplier of 1 applied to it. It'll have a multiplier of 1 because it's entirely in the x direction. Uh, and we don't have any external reactions, or didn't, don't have any reactions on joint C in the x direction. Although, you know what, I am actually going to put a multiplier of 1 on here because in my original 3 body diagram, it is a pin joint there, so I do have a 4CX uh, there, although we'll calculate later that is actually equal to 1, or sorry, equal to 0. Then, uh, joint C in the y direction, I have, uh, let's see here, uh, here, let's see, on joint C in the y direction, I have one unknown member force, and that's uh, member AC, and to get the component of that, that's going to be equal to positive 0 0.6 or positive 3 over 5. Then, to get the, uh, then I also need to consider the uh, external reaction. And then that's so that's going to be I could put 7.5 kips there and I may be tempted to but that's not going to get me my correct answer. Instead, we need to remember that this matrix is a coefficient matrix. I'm not putting actual values of forces in there. And in fact, um, this uh, now on my diagram here I do actually have the member the value for that force. The reason I already have that is because pre when I put this graphic together, if you remember from the previous video, I solved for the external reactions treating the entire truss as a single rigid body. You don't need to do that, at least when using a, a matrix method. Instead, we simply treat the external reactions as one of our unknowns, and we'll solve for it by inverting the matrix. Next, I want to move on to joint D. Next, I want to move on to joint D here. So we should have everything we need for joint C. So we have joint D here, got a little off the track. So we have joint D, this is going to be perhaps the most, most complex joint, and as the center joint, that's not any great surprise. So let's first look in the x direction. So this is going to be fun. Uh, CD will have a multiplier of negative 1 uh, for equilibrium in the x direction. And DE, oh, got that a little backwards. CD will have a multiplier of negative 1 and DE will have a multiplier of positive 1 uh, uh, for the equilibrium of joint D in the x direction. Then AD will have a multiplier equal to four, a negative 4 over 5, uh, negative because it's pointing in the negative x direction, 4 over 5 because that's the slope. Then BD will have a multiplier equal to 4 fifths instead of negative 4 fifths, and those will be our four unknown uh, forces, or the components of the four unknown forces on joint D in the x direction. And there are no reactions applied to this. Uh, no reactions or external loads applied to joint D. So the, these columns here and these columns here remain uh, unaffected. Uh, or the, the, this, the reaction columns and the external load column remain unaffected. Then joint D in the y direction. I will have two forces here. I'll have AD, the, the, the component of AD in the y direction. And that's going to be a positive 3 over 5 or the multiplier to get the component of it in the y direction. And then BD will have the same multiplier, 
3 over 5. Next, I want to move on to uh, my final joint, which is joint E. My final joint, which is joint E. And in the x direction, I'm going to have a negative 1 on DE. And BE will have a multiplier of negative uh, 4 over 5. Then in the y direction, the only unknown member force will be BE. And this will be equal to positive 3 over 5. Positive 3 over 5. And then E in the y direction will have a multiplier of 1 because that's acting purely in the y direction in uh, on, I should say, joint E. Okay? And notice, uh, for our reactions that are uh, purely in the x and y direction, it doesn't surprise us that each only appears in one equation. Typically, if a reaction is on a joint, it'll only appear once in your matrix, and that'll have a coefficient of 1. But if you had some reactions that were uh, applied at an angle or something, then they wouldn't be pure Cx and Cy, they'd just be a C, for example. Then they would appear twice in your uh, matrix. So let's go back through this and do a double check, because if we don't get this right, it's going to uh, cause some problems. So I want to double check my matrix. Always good practice to make sure we got everything nice and proper. Uh, here, if this will stop scrolling on me. So joint A, on the x direction we have 1 on AB and negative 0.8 on AC and positive 0.8 on AD. No problem there. In the y direction, we have negative 0.6 on AC and negative 0.6 on AD, and then an external load of 10. Again, it's opposite the actual applied load because um, we moved it to the other side of the equation, the equation of equilibrium. Then on joint B, in the x direction, we have a negative 1 on FAB, and um, then for our two diagonals, on BD, we have a negative 0.8 and a positive 0.8 on BE. Makes sense? Then joint B in the y direction, both of these should be a, a positive point, or sorry, a negative 0.6, and that is indeed what we have. Joint C, we have an external, we have a uh, reaction, an unknown reaction uh, of CY on joint C. So actually, let's for, on joint C, First, let's actually look uh, or confirm the x direction. That'd be logical. So we have, okay, go back here. We have now uh, C, Cx in the, um, so again, Cx, let's look at the joint C in the x direction. We have a multiplier of 1 on FCD, which is what we would expect, and point at, at 8 on FAC and nothing else, which is again what we would expect joint C in the y direction, we should have a 1 on uh, CY, which is what we have, and we can't forget the 1 on CX, which isn't shown on this diagram for the X reaction, or for the X equilibrium equation. Then for the Y, we have a 0.6 on uh, AC, and good, that's all we have, that's good. There shouldn't be anything on CD for equilibrium in the Y on joint C. Then joint D, in the x direction, I would have negative 1 and 1 for CD and DE, good. And then AD and BD should have a, well, for in the x direction, a negative 0.8 on AD and a positive 0.8 on BD, good. Then on uh, joint E in the x direction, I should have a negative 1 on FDE, which is what I do have, and a negative 0.8 on FBE. Uh, with no uh, reactions at joint E because it is a roller joint. Good. Then on joint E in the y direction, I have uh, a positive 0.8 on BE, no other member forces, and a positive 1 uh, for our reaction EY. So this checks out. We have everything we need uh, in our matrix. So let me go ahead and clean this up a bit. We now have the complete matrix and we can stop uh, bouncing back and forth between uh, two different, oh, between two different cells or between two different programs and screens. So that becomes a little bit simpler. So let me go ahead and label all of this. Maybe I'll put a box around this. Format cells, okay, a border. Let's put a border around this, maybe an outline. And maybe I'll go and label all of this. Maybe another border here, maybe I'll merge cells. 
I'll go ahead and call this matrix A. And I'm going to be consistent with our uh, previous here, let me, uh, our illustration here, where we had A, uh, A times the matrix, the variables X will equal matrix B. So this would be matrix B. The opposite of our applied loads would be matrix B. And for those of you who are familiar with Excel, this I know this may be a bit tedious and uh, something you're already familiar with, but I am going to illustrate this um, because I'm going to use some commands that some people don't see very often in Excel. Uh, nothing too complex, just the inverse, matrix inverse, matrix multiplication, etc. Okay, the first thing I need to do is to get the, uh, and I'll go, I'll go ahead and put a box around this as well. That's our matrix B, although I want to be consistent and use the same thickness. Okay, now I want to create an inverse of this. So I'm going to label this, going to merge and center again, and I'm going to matri uh, I'm going to uh, label this A, and I'll just put to the negative one. Or actually, I can probably just do a superscript here. Oh no, I'll just put, I'll just put this to the negative one to indicate that this is a matrix inverse. Now, if you're not familiar with a with Excel, there's many ways to do there. Like anything else in Excel, there's many ways to do this. This is the way I usually do it, but you can use your own method. I'm going to select a 10 by 10 area. So I need, let's see, uh, I need to select the entire 10 by 10 area. 2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So I have 10 rows. And I might go ahead and put a border around this. Not strictly necessary, but it helps keep things organized. And I'm going to say that this is equal to M inverse. And I need to select the array that I want to invert. And I want to invert, oh, I have a problem. And the problem that I have is I selected too large of an area. See, I selected, I made the slight mistake of including my, uh, including my labels in my, uh, in my uh, matrix. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to have that as my area, so I'm actually going to get rid of this. And reselect everything but still doing a 10 by 10 area, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Had the right number of rows, but the wrong number of columns. Or sorry, by versa, wrong number of, uh, right number of columns. I don't know, right number of rows, wrong number of columns. One of those things. Okay, so I'm going to then select this and apply my N, my N inverse command, my inverse matrix command. M inverse, I will select the entire area the entire array. Now I can't just press enter because that won't apply the command to the entire matrix. I need to select, or I need to input this not with the, not with the enter key, but with the, co the key combination control shift enter. And doing this, I now have this entire area programmed as my M inverse. So again, if you're not familiar with that, you select the entire area and then input the command M inverse. And then inside the parentheses, you select the entire area from this cell to this cell that you want to invert. And maybe I can go ahead and just copy this here. Matrix B. And I could probably do this better with some included references and things like that. Let's see what went incorrectly here. Ah, well, actually what I'm going to do is instead, I made the same kind of mistake again. I'm going to get rid of this. And I want these to be purely numbers. So. I'm going to go ahead and put a border around this. I don't want my labels included in my matrix. So, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and say this is equal to this entire inner matrix or this entire uh, matrix here and just control shift enter and I can just copy it and reference it that way. And finally, I'm almost done. My variables uh, X, my actual forces. Now to get these, I'm going to um, to get a nice label for this. I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to pay special, let's do the transpose if I can get that uh, here, the transpose, there we go. 
again, how did I do that? Okay, um, if you're not familiar, I'm going to, I, I want to have basically what were previously my uh, column labels, I want as my row label. So I'm gonna select all that, copy, and then paste that, but paste special, and I want my uh, transpose here. Where did that go? My transpose, there we go. And the transpose just means flipping the rows and columns effectively. But maybe I don't want that formatting, so I'm gonna copy that and uh, paste special. Let's see, where'd that go? So, oh, C, and then paste special. Uh, and I wanna just paste the uh, formats here, just to erase all of the uh, borders and such. And this is gonna be my matrix X. And we could set this up cleaner, but I'm just gonna do a quick and dirty uh, method for this. I'm just putting together a very quick and dirty uh, spreadsheet. And how this is gonna work, remember back here, the matrix X, which is our uh, final variable matrix, is equal to the inverse of our coefficient matrix times our, uh, our external uh, load matrix, or often referred to as our constant matrix. Often we refer to this as the co we refer to A as the coefficient matrix and B as the constant matrix. Uh, let's see here. So I'll, now all I really have to do is select this area and then use the command M malt, and I'm going to multiply the uh, coefficient array, comma, the uh, the constant array. Close parentheses and I use the exact same control shift enter. And what do you know? We now have member forces, all unknown forces. And let's double check with what we had last time. So our external reactions, um, previously we had CY uh, equal to 7.5, EY equal to 2.5. We had AC equal to negative 12.5, indicating compression, uh, CD equal to 10 uh, kips tension. I had BE, equal to negative 4.167, which is compression. Uh, I had DE, I'm just going down the list I have in my notes here. I had DE equal to 3.33 kips tension. AD equal to negative 4.176 compression. AB equal to negative 6.67 kips compression. BD equal to 4.176 kips tension, positive. Uh, and then that would go through it, and that's all of it. So. We see now that we got the exact same results using our matrix method that we did in our um, using our uh, series of free body diagrams. Now I know this can be tedious, especially uh, putting in all of these things, putting in all of our coefficients, and it does take some time. But uh, if you're, especially for larger projects, that can, this can be uh, a little more, a little faster, and also it, it's a little more uh, automatic in the sense that it's more of a turn the crank method. Um, if you do it, uh, it can be it can be tedious, but it's it, in some ways it's easier to get everything right. But the real reason I'm teaching you this, the real reason I want you to know about this, is that this fundamentally is how uh, computer programs work in the background. So, if you are using a uh, a trust program or a trust or a simple tr idealized trust program, and or more even more advanced programs, uh, every time you plug in a member or plug in a for, the, for example, many uh, simple programs operate on a joint and member model where you will input a coordinate for a joint and then you'll connect them via member and then you'll apply forces to them and solve and have the computer plug and chug um, based on uh, based on the geometry you input, the reactions you input, and the uh, external loads you input, and it will plug and chug and find the member forces. And for and but for uh, but for a simple trust model, this is exactly what it's doing in the background. Uh, we're just doing it manually and we're just doing it so you can actually sort of see under the hood. I want you to, as uh, students to understand uh, what is happening in the background of uh, uh, finite element and uh, computer modeling packages. So you do need to have an appreciation for how the software is working. Now for more complex things, especially more uh, complex finite element models, you wouldn't want to do all of those uh, elements by hand. You'd end up, you can easily end up with uh, the, the matrices and more advanced programs and more detailed analysis. You might You could very easily have a thousand by a thousand or ten thousand by ten thousand matrix or something really crazy like that but uh, for simple models like this for simple problems like this should say where you have a 
you know, a simple trust model, that kind of thing. This is something you could actually do by hand with pen and paper if you want to. So if you were stuck in a desert island and had to design a truss, uh, and if you had a, if you, if you recalled the, the algorithms for inverting matrices, you could use this method with a, a pen and paper. But uh, I don't know why you would have to solve for a truss for, truss forces on a desert, stranded on a desert island, but in case you have to, uh, maybe if you're the professor in Gilligan's Island or something, you'd have to do that. Um, anyway, so I guess this is what the professor in Gilligan's Island was doing back in the 60s or something. Or is that the 70s? Uh, anyway, whatever. Okay, so uh, I guess that was 60s, I suppose. But uh, anyway, looking back here, uh, so again, a summary, what we did is we looked at each of our individual joints. Based on our exploded free body diagram, we looked at each individual uh, joint and we applied appropriate coefficients uh, to a matrix to create equations of equilibrium. We applied uh, coefficients of one for external for our re for our uh, reactions, and then we applied the in the uh, opposite, not the inverse, but the opposite of any applied loads. We created our matrix. We created our uh, large matrix. We inverted it, and then we multiplied it by our constants, and we got our final uh, member internal forces. And at the same time, solving all in one fell swoop, uh, we got the uh, external reactions as well. So uh, again, this may be uh, kind of tedious and a bit more than you would tend to do for a simple truss. Something simple like this, you usually don't solve with matrices, but you can if you really like matrices. Uh, I, when I solve these, I tend to use hand, pen and paper methods, but truth be told, this is a bit more resilient and less error prone than some of the more hand methods. Uh, but anyway, that's the basic method. If nothing else, it will hopefully give you an appreciation for what is going on behind the scenes inside uh, computer structural analysis programs. All right, that'll do it for today. Thank you for watching, and as always, thank you.